Hey guys, welcome into another episode of From the Wing. I am Christian Clark, the Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com and the Times Picune. On today's show, we're going to talk a lot about this Pelican Suns game. Devin Booker went crazy. The Pelicans kind of sort of made it competitive, but not really. They never got within more than seven points um, down there at the end. They closed with Zion at center, and we're definitely going to talk about that. We're going to revisit some of our homestand predictions. The Pelicans are kind of one of those teams that in danger of dropping into play in tournament territory right now. They're a game ahead of the seventh place Phoenix Suns after after Monday night's game. And then at the end of the show, we're going to talk a little bit about this Iowa LSU game. I was able to watch the first half in the media room before Pelican Suns started, and then we might have had a second monitor going, and I might have been paying attention to that one too while I was on deadline watching Pelican Suns, hoping to form coherent thoughts while, frankly, uh, a more interesting game was going on. Adam, I, let's start with the Booker stuff. We can we can definitely spend a lot of time on, on the center stuff, but this is three straight games with 50 or more points against the New Orleans Pelicans. This spans last to, back to last year, but this has not been done since Wilt Chamberlain. Devin Booker is now part of the, this hasn't been done since Wilt Club, what the heck, man? Why? Why is he doing this? Because he hates me. Like, <laughs> specifically me. He wants me to feel sorrow and sadness uh, whenever he's in town. I look, it, this is one of those things that sucks because, like, people predict it all day. They're like, surely Book isn't going to come out of, like, a four-game slump against New Orleans in a game that both of those teams need surely that won't be what takes place and he won't drop 50 on their head again. And so like, we all kind of know, and we're just like, we don't want to talk about it because if I acknowledge it, then it's real. And, and then it just, it begins and he just starts making everything. Um, it didn't help that the looks were really good too. Um, a lot of them. So there Willie was, green, there was Willie green used the S word and I'm not talking about S H I T. I'm talking about S O F T. Yeah, that it when it when it comes to sports, I call it S A W F T. Um mm, five letter. I agree. Word. I agree. Um it look, we're uh, I'm never gonna be mad about Willie showing like an extra level of passion. Like we're fans and we're stupid. We always want him to yell. Um, so it's nice to see him like tap into it, you know. I've been jokingly wanting him to curse for two years, and it's like a, a dream of mine. Yeah, they didn't look, they they got Basically, the Phoenix sold out against Zion in the paint. That was the one thing they were truly concerned with. Willie kept two shooters out, all like two real shooters out all night, and then normally had like Herb or um, or Najee as like a third shooter. And Phoenix didn't care. They just harassed the top of the arc and sold out on the paint and gave you everything else. And we, yeah, it was just a lot of guys in spaces that they didn't want the ball. And it looked really super duper passive. Um, it was it was ugly. It was really really ugly for like a really really long stretch, especially the first half. But I mean, honestly, the first three quarters. I like to think I have pretty good intuition. I think it has helped me be right on some stories over the years. I don't bet one thousand percent, but I got to tell you, I had a very strong feeling before this game that the Pelicans were not going to win. And when I've had the strong feelings in recent weeks. They've been pretty accurate. I just did not feel good about this game because of the Brandon Ingram factor. I mean, definitely a part of it. It's just like against these these good, motivated teams. I mean, obviously you want the Pelicans to be at full strength, but it worried me that the Suns were coming off this pretty bad loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder. And you you hate playing you know pretty good teams coming off of losses. It happened with the Boston Celtics, right? They lost to the Atlanta, Atlanta Hawks yeah. twice in Atlanta. DeJounte Murray had a game where he took 44 freaking shots and like, willed the Hawks to a win and you knew Kobe. you were going to get a pretty motivated Boston Celtics team coming into New Orleans. That's exactly what you got. They tightened the screws defensively in the third quarter and the game was pretty much over. And the Phoenix Suns looked motivated after a, a blowout loss to the Thunder in Oklahoma City. Devin Booker just came out and obliterated the Pelicans and they did not have an answer. They did not match their force, their energy. We yeah. are two of the biggest Herb Jones fans on earth. It has not gone well for Herb Jones against Devin Booker the last few matchups. And like that is putting it very, very mildly. 
I, I rewatched this whole game this morning because I wanted to have a really good handle on it. Like maybe it was just Sorry. hindsight, but it was like, why are the Pelicans letting him catch the ball? Like if a guy's putting 50 on me twice and he gets off to a good start, like I'm calling a timeout and be like, Herb, don't care anybody else. Like you do not need to help deny him the ball. Do not let him catch the ball. And if we're going down, it is going to be because, you know, Kevin Durant cooked Trey Murphy. That was who was guarding him or Zion Williamson. And, could have happened, but you know, I'm, I would have been at the point that's like, we're just not letting Devin Booker even like catch the ball. And it's like, Herb was still, you know, like defending within the team context and, and Devin Booker was still getting some easy catches and that felt bad and wrong to me. And like, he wasn't even getting doubled. It just, it looked very easy in, in a game, you know, the Pelicans really needed to win. If they had won this game, Adam, they would have been three games ahead of the Suns with seven to go it would have made them very difficult to catch for the play. And I mean, this was a, a extremely important game. And now, you know, the leads down to one Phoenix clinched the head to head tiebreaker. It was just, even though the Pelicans were missing Brandon Ingram, I was a little bit alarmed that, you know, they just didn't match the sun's force. Yeah. I, I mean, part of this is just like, it's really tough to play against a team that has Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. Like Devin Booker is the one that always cooks us. You're just as afraid of Kevin Durant doing the same thing. And you have even less, applicable size matchups for Kevin. So inviting Kevin to do the same thing, you know, historically he's a little bit more like a little bit more passive than book. Like book is happy to drop 60 on your head any night. It, it could come anytime. He's happy to just shoot the lights out and look for what it's worth. KD was as well. Like he was like five of six on his first, uh, his first six, three point attempts. And he doesn't even usually take that many. Um, this was tough. It was really, really tough. They like, Phoenix, who they've been all year, is those two guys in a lot of ISO situations and a lot of simple pick and roll situations. And they just try to, they don't do anything super creative. And they've actually been pretty bad with Beal and even Beal made shots. They, they're a team that's like their offense isn't great, but they have great offensive players that you would historically want to be able to lean on their defense. And they usually can't. And in this game, they were able to um, wait, wait, wait. You said their offense isn't great, but they have great offensive players. We talk about the Pelicans or Suns. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know exactly. you're talking about the Suns. It's just, yeah, I'm making the, a comparison here and these yeah. teams are alike too. And that there is this really great collection of offensive talent, but you are sometimes left with the feeling that one plus one plus one equals 2.6 and not four or five on some nights. Yeah. And I think, I do think part of it is, both teams don't have that that pure point guard. That's at least a component of it. Right. And they could be and and the the guys on the on Phoenix have more experience getting hotter and executing in those kind of situations and pulling up from distance and breaking defenses. Like they're they're going to be Hall of Fame guys and they've they've done it on the biggest stages possible. So, you know, if if that's what it's going to come down to, and look, that's what it was. This was a play. This is playoff basketball. This is probably the biggest thing that's frustrating about the game. The playoffs started already. They started a week ago. The this run into the West. There are eleven teams over five hundred. Houston got the memo. Everybody in the West has the memo. The Mavs are what haven't won haven't lost a game in twelve games. Houston was on an eleven game run. Everyone's over 500. Oh, and you know, next year, Memphis, another year of Wemby. I, it, this, this conference is preposterous. So the idea that you go into any of these nights, and I didn't even mean to get ranty, and here we are. The idea that you go into any of these nights and come out soft, and it's true, you flatly did. And I'm staring straight at Zion on this one. Like, I, it, you have to be the guy, and you can't wait to be the guy. You can't just gauge, ah, oh, well, you know, I want to kind of do it here and I'm going to save up for the third quarter. You were down 20 in the first because you just wouldn't attack the defense that they showed you. And I get it. They're showing you three and four guys. But God damn, like the idea that you don't even press it, you don't even dribble into it, you don't even jump and try to create out of it. Like it was just too lackluster, too passive. And when you're getting hammered on the other side, like, the reason you miss B.I. is his length, and it's not even his shot making. It's his ability to be on the ball and to be able to create for other guys because you have a shortage of ball handling on this team. When Zion or B.I. misses game, you don't. not only do you not have a true point guard, but you have a lot of guys that are like B. 
B-plus initiators. And now you're overtaxing CJ by making him create for 50% of the game, which at this point we just shouldn't ever do. And, oh, Jose's out too. So, like, you just – you don't have a – you don't have cogent beginnings to offensive plays. And it's just all of that just fell on top of each other. And yeah, oh God, I'm all aggravated all over again. I don't know how you rewatch this. He's Randy and Ranty today, folks. Both of them. Both of them. Um, yes. So the the defense that the Suns played on Zion, they they had a very clear game plan going in. Their starting center is Yusuf Nurkic, a massive Bosnian man. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of Yusuf Nurkic's dad, but his dad was like, a, I think a police officer in Bosnia and he's like Nurk, but plus 30 years. And he literally weighs 400 pounds. Google, Google Yusuf Nurkic's dad sometime. If you want to be entertained. Um, and Yusuf Nurkic was parking in the paint. He was completely ignoring Jonas Valanciunas and the Pelicans offense looked extremely clunky. And I liked what you said earlier when you said the playoffs have already started. Yes, you are right. These games really, really matter. It is, it is a knife fight in the mud right now. We are at that point. This is the fun part of the season. It could be excruciating if it doesn't go your way. And you're seeing defensive configurations that you're going to see in the playoffs because these, these games matter so much. And like, look, this is how teams are going to guard Zion and the Pelicans in the playoffs once they get there. You know, Larry Nance Jr. even said that at practice today. He's like, look, I'm glad we're seeing it right now because like they're going to do like teams are going to continue to do this to us. He said that today. He was like, the Magic are going to do this to us on Wednesday. The San Antonio Spurs, I mean, I don't know. They don't they don't care at all, really. So like we'll see. They just but shut everybody down. You're going to see, my point is that I think you're going to see this defensive configuration of like the other team parking their center in the lane and walling off those Zion drives until the Pelicans do something about it. And I think part of the solution is Zion just playing with more force. I think part of it is just like the Pelicans don't have a ton of, of shooting in the starting lineup. But part of it is like, look, these guys are all like, there, there are a lot of possessions in the first half where it's like three, four, five Suns players are in or near the paint. It's just like, make the pass and shoot the open three. Or if you don't want to shoot the three drive and kick, like just, just be decisive and play with force. And it's, it's not perfect. It's not, I mean, Zion is not a jump shooter. You know, it's Tunis, Not really. I, I get that it is not perfect, but the Pelicans, they, they just can't allow like teams to, to do this gimmicky thing and let it work as well as it worked on Monday night. And it's just so many guys, but yeah, sure. On a on a given night, I don't want to have to rely on Najee's offense. I don't want to have to rely on Herb to get me 18. I don't want Dyson to be like offensively taxed. But I can't have any of you out there afraid to take a shot. When you are the guy that gets the open look and you're going to have no window, but you're the only window we've got, you got to have conviction about what you're going to do. And no one did. Like Dyson is the only guy that I can say like had a good game or played hard from start to finish of that game. And like, I was happy to see it because he had a rough outing the go before and he's like working his way back. And so that's fine. But it just, it really pains you in a matchup like that when you have so little guard play and you have so little ability to pressure space and somebody like Najee isn't getting his shots off, isn't dribbling into the paint and trying to just get off those little like eight and 10 footers that he likes to take. You have to have that. Like somebody's got to be coming in. Like if Zion's going to catch that wall, who's running in behind him to catch something behind him? Who is taking advantage of the space that's being left open? And it like it's not an ideal person right now, but to Willie's credit, like there were our shooters were mostly out there. Like you had two guys and they just said, screw you, make it. I'll just press the guy physically and tell him to take the shot. And he won't. And and it's not like this is the first time the Pelicans have seen this configuration of, oh, the other team center is just sitting in the lane waiting for Zion. They've seen that a lot this season. And like oftentimes one of the ways that they deal with that is they clear out the right side of the floor. They have Zion on there. They have the center set the screen, uh, you know, kind of in the middle of the lane. And they just clear out one side of the floor and go to the four or five pick and roll, which has been a pretty good action. And the other three guys are on the, the weak side of the floor and they're properly spaced. And it's just like, you guys, I've seen you guys do that this year. Like, why didn't we get
get to that a little bit more in this Phoenix game. I mean, I just think there are there are counters, and like I just I just don't accept that that you know like the defense ignoring the Pelican center should work as well as it did Monday. Like there are things you do to counteract that, you know, like clearing one side of the floor and the four or five pick and roll being one of them. I mean, just like ball movement off the ball is, is that's, another one. That's the, that's the one like it, that's the killer for this whole thing is like, you're not going to have like this polished, incredible offensive execution. I, I even understand that if the four or five pick and roll stuff, like it's a little gimmicky when it comes to like who we're running it with and the options that come out of it. It's not going to work perfectly against everybody, but like we saw it in like the end of the third quarter and the fourth, like the reason the game didn't turn into a 30 point game is like all of a sudden they just started really moving the ball. And that was everybody like Herb stepped it up a little bit. Larry stepped it up a little bit. CJ moved a little faster and it was just like the willingness to move quickly that started to open stuff up. Suns over helped. They started turning the ball over like, they're not this crazy execution team, and we made it easy for them. They didn't run anything super complex offensively. They were honestly just screening really, really high, and it was confusing the absolute shit out of us. Like, Herb was confused. Herb was taking a screen like four feet above the three-point line and spinning and not sure if he's going with the screener or if he's staying up. And it looked like he was supposed to stay up. At least that's what the other guy thought. And you're ending up with these miscommunications that that were leading to open threes. It's just it was just kind of crazy. I think it was just like a crap effort from everybody that was out there um, to start that game, and it created such an incredible, like insurmountable lead. Especially with those dudes, like you give those dudes 20 points in the first quarter. Like in what world are you coming back on Kevin Durant and Devin Booker from down 20? Like this team, it's, it's not happening. It was. It was pretty close to being over after after one quarter, unfortunately. And and to be fair, I mean the Pelicans got it to seven with like two and a half minutes left. They could have got it to five. CJ missed this great look at a floater. And you know, five point game with like two minutes, fifteen seconds left, the odds are not in your favor, but it it maybe could have gotten interesting. Yeah. Um let's talk a little bit more about the the handling of the center position because I think you know, one of the the big storylines we've seen trends we've seen over the past month is that Jonas Valanciunas's minutes have gone down 11 times in the past 16 games Jonas has played fewer than 20 minutes they've gone to a lot of Larry Nance Jr for example last week against Oklahoma City Larry Nance Jr played the entire fourth quarter this was a game where he was playing okay he had to come out of the game in the third quarter um with with injury stuff but like they're they're spamming Larry a lot and he has had some good games. Like, and I think Larry has helped the Pelicans win a lot of games this year. So I'm not like saying he's a bad player or anything like that, but we're, we've really just seen Willie hit the Larry button. And then one of the interesting things we saw on Monday night was final 451. The Pelicans did not have Jonas or Larry on the floor. They went with Zion at center. If, if you want to call it that it was Dyson Daniels, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, you know, three wings between six foot eight and six foot ten, and then it was CJ McCollum. And that was what they rode with for the final five minutes of the game. I thought they created some pretty good looks out of that, but you know, it was just kind of telling that basically they could not solve the the Suns sag off of you defense on Monday. And so they felt like their only option was Z at the center for the final five minutes. That's what that told me. Yeah. The I think there's there's been a lot of conversation all year in every loss that we've had. And it's, you know, it's a very common refrain from everybody like play JV more. Um, and I've definitely debated. We've had episodes where we've come on right after a loss and said, like, I really would have loved to see him to start the half, start the quarter. think it could have changed things. Um, overall, like I, I don't think there's that much meat on the bone to talk about with the center position. Like, I really just think. We like we know th the position is a little bit indicted. Like we we don't the most interesting center on this roster right now is Brandon Ingram. Like that's the most intriguing center we have for what we're going to do in the playoffs and what the ceiling of the team is going to be is Brandon Ingram. Um, and I think we just kind of know that, and it is what it is. And you're trying to work around it. Like I, there's a reason Larry's numbers don't look great, and he always gets played, and it. It like go look at look at the drop reps from JV when he's playing. Like they're wide open threes. It's it's 
it's just too easy sometimes. And like you have to, as much as people don't want to think about it because they just want to think about the ease of the offense, you have to think about the defense they play when he's in. When they're playing drop and Nurkic is just diving really hard and he's more athletic than JV getting to the rim, like it's just, it's useless. So at least everybody else gets a little more comfortable in their role when Larry plays. And I, I get that you can go analytics that to death and you can go try and tell me that JV is going to fix everything. I, I just don't believe they have a solution. And the most intriguing thing that I've seen them do so far this year was when B.I. survived against guys like Jared Allen, when he survived in the next game. like He had kind of three three games in a row where we went to him at center, and the reps looked like pretty all right, and we didn't even help. So I just missed him a lot. This game just made me miss B.I. over and over and over again because we found some versatility with him that we don't have elsewhere. Um, I love J.B. to death, um, but I don't. I just don't know how playing him more fixes anything in that game. I get that Nurkic had a ton of tap backs. And so you think like, oh yeah, rebounding. But like, it it's a whole different problem on the other end. You don't get the little defensive uptick that you got. We only got it for a blip. Like end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth, we had like a six or seven minute run where he finally played defense. It wasn't when JV was on the floor. Yeah, look, that's that's the trade-off right there. I mean, Jonas Valanciunas is has been one of the game's elite defensive rebounders for like a decade. I mean, the Pelicans' defensive rebounding rate when he's on the floor is better than, you know, the number one team in the NBA in defensive rebounding. And when he's off the floor, the Pelicans, if you just look at their defensive rebounding rate, it's like a bottom five mark. It makes an enormous difference. Jonas Valanciunas is a more talented offensive player than Larry Nance Jr. There's some times when Larry, you know, like he just, I don't think he's as aggressive enough as a scorer as he needs to be and is not like looking at the basket when he catches the ball, you know, sometimes it's like eight feet of the hoop where it's like, did you like, you just have to like try to go score here. I mean, he is like can distribute well. Um, but look, the, the trade-off is, is defense. And I think it's pretty significant. I really do like what you're saying about, you know, Jonas in the pick and roll and Nurkic diving. Like I, I saw that when I watched this game on Monday, like it, it did hurt them of JV getting put in the pick and roll. So there's a trade-off and there's no perfect solution. And the Pelicans front office knows that. And you know how I know they know that? Because they've been trying to trade for a starting center for like nine months. They surveyed the market and before the season started, David Griffin even talked about getting more of a rim protector. Like he said this stuff on the record right around draft time. He said, we, you know, last summer he said, we want shooting and more rim protection at center. And they got some shooting with Jordan Hawkins with the 14th pick and they never really got that rim protection unless you're going to count Cody Zeller. Um, at the trade deadline, we, we talked, you know, like the names the Pelicans were interested in. We mentioned those a lot. Uh, Jared Allen with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think one, the Pelicans would have given up a lot for it if he had been available. He was not available. You know, Jared Allen was like instrumental in turning their season around. Wendell Carter Jr., you know, a guy who does a lot of things well, maybe not like one elite skill, but like I think definitely a guy on this roster the Pelicans would feel comfortable closing with. Like Willie Green, Jaron Collins would have enough confidence in him defensively to close the majority of games with him at center. He was not available either. Still on the Orlando Magic. He's playing pretty well recently. So look, we, we know what they tried to do. They weren't able to pull it off. I do go back to 2019 when there was the Jared Allen, or not, it's not the Jared Allen stuff, the Miles Turner stuff. And I was against the Turner stuff at the time. And now I'm just like, should the Pelicans have just done that? Would they have been better off if they just like baked this cake from the beginning with Miles Turner and Zion center and power forward? Yeah, it's, you know, the name, like you said, the names are out there. Um, we've talked about it a bunch and anything. Honestly, like any improvement, there's a multiple styles of guy that fit. Like, look, the free agent market, I'll tell you right now, like for, for people who haven't delved into this much yet, and we don't need to because it it's still, it's just after the, the, the April just started. We're, we're just getting here. We do not have to do this yet. Free agent market's terrible. Um, the, you really only have in my mind, like one realistic option based on what we've seen reported um and that's like throw a bag at isaiah hartenstein and then bring like try to tr bring jv back and do like hartenstein as the as the starter with jv as like a very very heavy bench big um 
other than that, it's like it's very slim pickings. A bunch of bunch of thirty year olds that make too much money, and you're you don't want any of them. Then in terms of the trade market and guys that are available, like everybody that's got the guy that you want isn't giving him up. Like there's there's nobody out there that's just like this magic fix for this. Um, I think obviously the hope is that something shifts in Cleveland. We're staring at Cleveland. We've been watching them closely all year. I think the Nets are going to bring back Claxton. So I don't think that's – I think you're hearing that from his side and their side. He wants the bird extension. They want to give it to him. I don't think they have much of a choice because they're terrible. Um, so, yeah, um, anything helps. Like, honestly, Wendell is – a very, very different dude from Jared Allen. They're completely different players. And yet both of them are a large uptick in terms of what we can do offensively and defensively, like just stylistically, because Jared Allen is actually going to be feared out of the dunker spot and can play back to basket and give you a real rim defense and rebounding. Or you get Wendell, who's like, Oh, just a very versatile dude who can slide out to the three-point line. He can play out of the dunker spot. He can create from the nail. Like He can do a lot of things. He can make a lot of jump shots. Anything else, anything we can get. And I do, I do actually believe that like no matter what it is, even if the perfect deal isn't out there this summer, the Band-Aid has, has to be put on this summer, regardless of who it is. If it's Hartenstein plus JV, great, whatever. Something has to change because you've seen yes. enough from, from Zion and Brandon. You can't wait. I, I agree. You, you, I mean, you, you can't roll with Jonas and Larry. Like they, they're good. They're good, but there's just, there's just a ceiling there. And if the Pelicans like want to keep climbing, I think you've got to, you've got to try something different after the season. There's enough sample size there. Look, I think Zion Williamson, unique player, like the closest comparison to him is Giannis Antetokounmpo. And when I look at, you know, the Bucks roster building around Giannis and this time with the team. One of the things that helped them make a leap from pretty good to like elite team was that signing of Brooke Lopez in, I think, 2017. They went from a 44 win team to a 60 team. They signed Brooke Lopez to like a one year, $3 million deal that summer. Like it was not an obvious move at the time. And he kind of became a different player, but kind of. Oh, yeah. He became a completely <laughs> different player. But, yeah. you know, it could be something that's like you're you're finding the next thing. Like it could be a non a not obvious move, but you've got to try to find, you know, a, a guy who who can better complement Zion, I, I think, than than some of the people that they put next to him in, in his career in New Orleans. And, you know, I I remember being against like the Pelican. I'm like, should they even like try to go out and get Kristaps Porzingis? I was like, nah. And they've like the Pelicans, were like no, and not you know that's why the Boston Celtics are such a smart organization. They're like, you know, you know, let's bring them in and uh, get them around, get them in our culture, and they'll play a lot. And you know, he's he's just fit perfectly there. Like, what? No, no, it's just KP, Derek, Andrew. Like, you should one of those assets should have betrayed you, one of them, and they're all A plus additions, all yeah. of them. It's the most preposterous thing ever. I hate it. I'm so jealous. I hate it. Oh, and like Al Horford just like sips a little cup from the from the goddamn Holy Grail and returns his youth whenever he needs to and just spot starts for you for half the season. Whatever. So let me ask you this. Which non-Jokic, non-Embiid center, if you could take any of them off another roster and put them onto this roster, who would you pick and why? We're just we're just taking the two MVPs out of the equation. Okay. Um, uh, this one's obvious. I don't want. I don't want to say the name. I don't want to say it. I don't. Is he in the Southwest it. Division or no? Um, he no, he's not. Oh my my guy's in the Southwest Division. Oh okay. What, so we but we we're gonna do that. Yeah, we bro. Do, we, we I am that? taking I am taking Maxi Cleaver. No, I'm just kidding, man. I'm taking Victor Wembanyama. Of, of course, course, the guy are. with like 50 more freaking it's, blocks okay. than anybody else. We should rule him out too. We should. Rule <laughs> we him should. Out too. No one gets him. He's he's the the next coming of breaking the game from the five spot like Jokic did. I don't I don't want I don't want to do this. This isn't fair. Okay. Well, maybe a stupid game. Well, no. So I like there are two. There's one name that would piss off every uh, every fan that we have because it would be bringing someone back. And I'm not going to say his name. 
Um, but I think the one that is like hyper intriguing to me that like, you know, in some parallel world maybe could have happened. Bam out of bio. Just be the defensive juggernaut, pass the ball and have him knock down 10 to 15 and call it a day, get to the free throw line and make them like, Willie Green me? guy for sure. Like Willie oh, Green would be dude. trying to play Bam like 45 minutes, 40 minutes. every game. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Averaging 43 like he's Tibbs. Yeah. I mean, th there would be some Tibbs energy there. Like Willie Green could not play <laughs> Bam Adebayo enough. Like that's just that's just his type of guy. Mm -hmm. So if, good you, one. if you didn't if you didn't have to do Victor, it like it, so take Victor away cuz that's like I didn't want to say him cuz I felt like that was just as cheating as like taking Joker. So I was staring mm. down like, you know, that the guy who shall not be named. Is there anybody else or is the guy who shall not be named the other like obvious choice here? Who's the guy who shall not? Oh, oh, oh you know oh, who it is. I, I mean, honestly, I, th I think I'd rather have Porzingis. Oh, even though he, even though he's like, they've had to do like the injury management thing where he's like, they hold him out of like, one out of every three games, they hold them out of most back to backs and stuff. I don't know, maybe that, maybe, that? Yeah, no, you're you're probably right. I mean, like he who should not be named, like there are there are moments, and like I experienced this in the playoffs last year. I'm like, yeah, just the best defensive player on earth. Like he his peaks defensively are still so so high. And you know, the reason he gets like dragged over the coals on a lot of the the national shows is they expect him to be Jokic on offense. And that's just not what he is. Like he's not a play initiator. He's only a play finisher. And that would be fine here because we have play initiators. Just imagine Zion running into that Phoenix Suns wall. And there's three dudes, maybe four. And, uh, and the guy running down the baseline for the safety valve lob is Tony Ruffles. Mm. Just saying that'd be pretty hard to deal with. So Pelicans are one and three on this six game homestand so far. Got the magic on Wednesday, the Spurs on Friday. I believe when we, we, we only talked about like the, the first five games of the six games, but I think I said I was predicting two and three in the first five games and three and three overall. Cause I mean, the Pelicans just, I think they'll beat the Spurs. They need to beat the Spurs, but all of that is to say Pelicans need to freaking win these next two games. It'd be it'd be great to win these next two games before you got to go out west for four games. It really sucks to have to win the Magic game. Like when you were looking at these, this is the one that I was like, please pick up the OKC win so that you don't have to have the Magic win because they just match up really well against us. They have a lot of athletic size and they just give us a lot of problems in the paint. Like because they can pack it and they can recover out. Like they're just really, really athletic and all of them are 6'10". Oh, and Jonathan Isaac's just going to randomly play like all NBA defense for 18 minutes. Like, bro, that felt so unfair. Of pa they got they start the game with Paolo on Zion, and Paolo is already, you know, a really good defender. And then they bring in a better Zion defender off the bench. How is that fair? Look, they're going to have to write the ship. Like now, they need the Magic win for whatever reason. They're getting four and a half against the Magic right now, so that'll be interesting. I will be in the building, um, and hopefully, I'm there for a win. The Spurs are shutting everybody down. Vassell's shut down. Sohan's shut down. I'm waiting any minute to hear that like Wemby's going to like miss a three game skid and then show up for one and then be done for the season. Uh, he already qualified for Rookie of the Year, so and, and he's going to get DPOI votes and he's. You think he gets all? You think he gets any all all NBA third team votes? No. Okay. Um, just just curious. Then we get the Suns again. So look, this we talked about this. We alluded to this. We're going to be staring down that damn Sacramento Warriors Lakers three, and you're gonna need probably two. The Warriors aren't the scariest team in the world right now. Sacramento just got dealt like a death blow with Malik Monk being out. Like. That's rough. Lost Herter and Monk. Like they just have, like Keegan Murray is just going to have to shoot the absolute lights out for them to matter against good teams. Um, or Sabonis is going to have to drop 40 on you. Uh, that's a tough ask. Blazers, Suns, per, uh, Spurs, Magic. Like you, you just, you got to, you got to get three or four of these. You got to. Yeah. Like the, the number one goal right now is avoid the play in 
I mean, obviously, you just you've been in the play in two years. You you've experienced play uh, play in fortune that first year by you know being able to beat the Clippers on the road. But part of that was you know Paul George got COVID like the day of the game, basically, and that that helped them win that game. And then Don't they've experienced play in misfortune last year at home against Oklahoma City. By the way, Brandon Ingram, I think, still did get fouled on that three that he made. He should have been going to the line with a chance to tie that game. Nobody ever talks about that. Uh, go back and watch that. Go back and watch that. Um, but look, you just you want to stay out of the plan. You want to finish six or higher. I, I think it's going to be really hard to, to catch Dallas at this point. Um, the, the tiebreaker between Dallas and Orleans has not been completely determined yet, but the Pelicans are going to have to beat San Antonio, and the Mavericks are going to have to lose to Houston in the remaining game for the Pelicans to even have a chance. What Jalen Green looms, maybe he, he put up a he, stinker in this last one. I couldn't he, count on him for anything in this last one, but maybe. yeah, he does loom. But anyway, my only my point is, I think it's gonna be hard to get the five. I feel like Dallas yeah. is kind of got that at this point. Like and, they got to stay at six, and you know Phoenix is right there. They're one game back. There's one more Pelicans Suns game. The Suns have a really hard remaining schedule. Like stay in sixth and. The other thing I cared about, I, I do care about 50 wins. I'm a caveman. I care about round numbers. I care about this team having the second best regular season in franchise history. Five and two. That's what they need to go over these final seven games to get to 50. You heard it here first. He really, really, really cares about landing on the zero, zero dollar at the gas pump. I look, I'm, I, I, I have like Neanderthal brain. With hey, a lot of me, stuff. So I me don't too. Care. Look, we've been saying 50 for a while. Like this team, what we have one one fifty win season in, in our history. Is that right? Is it one or is it yes? Two? 2007, 2008, yeah. Chris Paul team, second MVP, First, yeah. MVP voting, 56 wins, second most successful team, 49 ones. Yeah. So, you know, this would be your second 50 win season ever. Like you've got to build this thing on something. And it would be great to do that. Now, for for people who don't know, like the the thing that we need against Dallas for the tiebreaker is we need to win the division, correct? Like we have to have the better division record. Is that that's the tiebreaker we need? Yeah. Well, if it's this, it, if it's the same division record, which I believe it would be, if the Pelicans beat San Antonio and the Mavericks lose to Houston, then it would shift the conference record, right? And Dallas may just smoke us outright, just given how they're playing right now, because they're just not losing anybody. Yeah. Um, which, you know, if if anybody saw like the per, the absolute, I'm going to try not to use the word again. I almost did it. I was going to use the same word for like the 6,000th time on the last three episodes. Um, Luca had this like really, really ridiculous move on Jabari Smith, where he like ended up jumping under the three point line and scooping late in the clock. And he made like a, like an 18 foot scoop shot. That was incredible. What, what even was that? Kyrie's game oh. winner a couple of weeks ago against Denver too. Left hand from 20 feet over Jokic. Mm. Yeah. Has this has this changed? So it feels like we went like real quick and we'll we'll move on. It feels like to me, I like in my head, I still think of I still think Jokic is the MVP. Um, but we had the incredible stability of Shea, the 30 point games, the consummate winning, and they're and they're going to have a chance at the fir at first place record. Do you think this last run from Luca proposes any real threat to the MVP standings or do you think it's too late in the season for him to sneak in there cuz look, he's been a darling for a few years now. Like people have been trying to throw some steam behind him to start every season for like the last 4 years. Yeah, I mean like he like there's a clear top 3. Um I think no matter how you order those top three, I don't think any of them are ridiculous choices. Like if you, if you, you know, Joe basketball fan said, Jokic is the MVP. You said, Shea is the MVP. You said, Luke is the MVP. I, I can't sit there and say, and be like, I think that's preposterous. Like, I think any of them would be deserving. Like the raw numbers with Luca are just insanity, bro. He's averaging 34 a game, nine rebounds, 10 assists. Like good God. Like the raw numbers are just insane. I mean, I don't know what you do with that, man. Um, the thing, the one thing that might separate, like maybe that to me, like, I don't know if you can get there is like, is he going to end up six or seven wins worse than Shea or Joker? And Joker did it a ton without Murray. And Shea just did it regardless of what his roster was and just played every night and scored 30 every single night. 
and, like and cons- clearly had the best defensive season out of out of those. Three yeah, teams. yeah, he like averaged over two steals a game, and like he had like three and a half stocks. Like it, it just the, the the most amazing thing about the Thunder to me is that they're I think they lead the league in turnovers forced, and they might lead the league in terms of like fewest turnovers committed. Like they're they're an elite team in terms of they never turn the ball over and they turn you over a ton. And like I I look at Shade Gillis Alexander as the biggest reason why. Like How he protects they, the ball and initiates their yeah. offense and like forces a lot of steals. Like that's one of the things that makes them amazing. How are they just like a crazy young team that doesn't have any young team attributes? Like they just don't. And maybe may, a lot of people have talked about it and are like, maybe it's that like Paul Pierce said this. He's like, maybe it's that they don't experience the, the struggle doesn't come till the playoffs come. Maybe that's true. But like, I would have loved a run of like five or six games where they did turn the ball over, where they did like take preposterous shots that they shouldn't take. And it just never happened. Like they don't make young team mistakes. They sometimes get beat because teams outshoot them because they're not this crazy three point shooting team. And some teams have successfully dared Giddy to like try and score 20 and he can't don't look recently because recently he can, I don't know why, but he's making them now that ugly ass shot. Um, yeah, they're just great. Okay, I was just curious. I just wanted to pulse check on MVP real quick. Yeah. Uh, and the other, the other thing with Oklahoma City, too, is Jalen Williams. Like, holy crap. Yeah. Both ends of the floor. Um, like, you know, shooting like, what, 45% on threes. Like, obviously, yeah. notch, knocks down catch and shoots at a really high rate, but like, self creates some offense. Great defender. He's, he's an incredible young player. Let's finish up um, with some a few thoughts on this Iowa LSU women's game, which was a great game for about three quarters there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we, we take technical difficulties here. It was a great game for like three quarters. Um, I was able to watch the first half in the media room and then we had a second monitor going you know, while we were Pelican Suns was going on, but it was a blast. Uh, in my women's tournament challenge, I picked Iowa. My wife picked LSU. So there was yes. there was some, uh, yeah, there was some stakes at the Clark household for this one. <laughs> yeah, they uh, so like you know everybody like everybody down here watched it. I had I had a ton of friends who like had Pelicans tickets that were like listing the tickets to try to just because they were going to watch LSU instead. Um, that's how much of a draw this had. And it's like a, you know, it's a repeat storyline from last year. There's a million through lines in it. Like it was, it's just, it was good television, even if the basketball is still not that great. Um, But yeah, they went under screens and stuff against like one of the best shooters in college basketball history. uh, And it didn't go well. And then she drove them and that didn't go well either. And they like stepped up defensively, started moving the ball through the paint and things got better. Uh, and then like Caitlin Clark just did not stop. She just kept doing the thing. She just kept shooting the 28 footers and making them and driving the closeouts and creating like she, yeah, she just had like, you know, they don't call her a legend for no reason. And she's, she proved it and, uh, didn't end well for Louisiana that night. 13.6 million people watched this game. It was the most most watched basketball game on cable since game seven of Cavs and Celtics in 2018. So the most watched basketball game on cable in like five freaking years. That That is pretty remarkable. Um, look, the, I think like the women's tournament is more compelling than the men's for a few reasons, but I think one of the biggest ones is there's there's familiarity with the storylines with these teams. Like we, we obviously got to watch LSU and Iowa play last year in this great national championship game, but like we know the characters in this story and that is different than the men's game where we have to relearn the characters every single year in, in men's college basketball because of the one and done stuff and they're just churning them out. And it's part of the reason why like the men's college basketball product kind of Kind of stinks right now, although I did watch, uh, really enjoy watching DJ Burns and Duke season. Don't get me wrong. So so you got to shout out DJ Burns. Like that's the the one quintessential uh, through line on, on the men's tournament is DJ Burns. And now the NFL is like rumored to be after him. But, you know, that's also like why teams like 
Villanova and, you know, that one time that Virginia did it and the reason UConn and Purdue are so good, the rest of the teams are one and done teams. Like the guys that get juniors and seniors onto their teams, especially with guard play that can shoot, like they win. They win these games because the other teams, a lot of them run not great stuff. Um, they they play a lot of zone and they do a lot of just like repetitious drive and kick and then settle for like a really bad three pointer at the end of the clock um, and miss it <laughs> and miss it a lot. So, yeah, it's it's definitely impacting the game. And it's it's part of the reason that like the women's game becomes more digestible. Like they're playing good basketball from like a strategic standpoint, like they see a thing. And it's also like. I used to think about this when I watched like um, like women's soccer and and tennis, like so like it can be a touch slower and like maybe they're not dunking every play, but it also like allows me to process what I'm watching a lot easier. And so it's more consumable when I'm staring at it. And like you said, we know all of those people and the storylines for that game especially are incredible. Then the storylines in the USC UConn game are incredible. Paige Becker is trying to come back. Juju Watkins, uh, Watkins is the exact opposite, like the the stellar freshman who can just score, you know, regardless of what you throw at her. Yeah, they just got more to sell. And to and here's the other piece of it that we didn't talk about. Like the networks have sold it. Like they have sold it. Papers have sold it. Writers have sold it. And we bought. So yeah. like and you know, it, it is like it, you know, Iowa LSU was almost like this this boxing fight that was great to promote because they're just the two teams were just so culturally different. And I think one of the best ways illustrations of that was last year, there was like a video of the LSU women, you know, like all wrapping the little Boosie in the locker room. And then somebody threw up the video of that side by side with like the Iowa women singing Miley Cyrus in their locker room. And it was like, these are the two cultures. And I, I just laughed really hard at that. Cause I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good way of saying, how these two teams are are different. It was a lot of fun watching their last two their two meetings against each other. You know, in the tournament these past two years, Angel Reese, you know, played really well in this game. It was maybe probably her last college game. Um, you know, I know she didn't get the results she wanted, but like I thought she really played well. Um, you know, battling through that ankle injury too. And Caitlin Clark's the truth, man. Like I, I mean, I, I'm going to be watching Indiana Fever games for sure. You know, like that's, that's how, like, that's how much I think of Caitlin Clark. Like she's, she's amazing. Yeah. Like for all the, for all the pettiness and stuff, like uh, people like I look, I laughed when her dad like ridiculed her from the sideline when she was complaining to the ref during that game, not too long ago, but like, she's no different from like Luca or any of them. Like they all do this now. This is just everybody. This isn't man or woman. This is every single guard that plays basketball. Now this is just part of what they do. They all are feeling themselves from the time they're 12 years old and they're ready to tell you about it. Like it just is what it is. Um, she's crazy, man. She just makes everything and she makes smart plays and she can make the shot a million ways. And she's going to end up doing like a Sabrina Unescu thing where she's going to do like, she's going to end up doing like a three point competition against somebody like all that stuff's going to happen. Um, she's got real like compelling stuff to her and her personality. Like, She's a little bit of an ass. Like, like she's like that's part of it. Like being intense like that and being like not the most likable at times is like part of what makes you compelling as a character. She is both a character and an incredible basketball player. And it's not just the shooting. She's she, just incredible at basketball. She needs she needs to win like she needs air. Like very, yeah. very competitive mama mentality type person and the competitiveness on the court, but you can tell she really puts in the work off the court too. Like I've seen NBA players. I, I guess I won't like use their names cause that would be a low blow, but like they're very competitive in the game and you know, they're, they're great competitors within that 48 minutes. And I'm not even talking about anybody in New Orleans, like other markets where I've covered players, but they're not that driven outside of that. They don't want to like do all the work that Kobe did or even like a fraction of that, you know, outside of when the game's going on. So, yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to keep going back to the, if for, for all the Shea praise, I'm going to keep going back to that, to the, the quote around all-star you want us to play or the IST, you want us to play harder, pay us more. Like it, unfortunately, like when the money gets this outsized, like that, it's part of the game. Like it, 
Halliburton said he th he's just a prop bet. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on in the game that, like, we could do a whole three-hour conversation about and whether or not it's a good thing. The girls are not plagued by that. Like, the college product is the best product. You play for LSU, you might make a mill or two, and that's a better prospect in a lot of cases, and it's why a lot of girls come back. The guys, yeah, they have some of that too. Like, some of the NIL, NIL stuff's there. A lot of these dudes are just going to go to the league and get that money anyway. Adam, you said it best. These are all playoff games at this point. I'll be in the blender Wednesday. I will be in the blender Friday, and then I'll be with the Pelicans when they start this two-game road trip in Phoenix and then go to Portland. Uh, Adam, appreciate you doing this, buddy, and we'll talk again soon. See you Wednesday.